The blessing of the Lord be upon you. I bless you in the name of the Lord. Let's go to God in prayer. I have things to talk about today. I want to share with you my heart. Father, I appreciate you. I thank you. Mm. Hallelujah. My God, you have been good to us. You've been wonderful. You've been awesome. We humble ourselves before you. We give you the glory. We give you the honor. We give you all the praise. It all belongs to you. Now, as I come today, Lord, I ask you to do as only you can do. Give me words to say that will help your people in Jesus' name. And I thank you, Lord. Amen. All right, we're going today to the book of Judges chapter 13. And I'm still talking about uh, my series on the favor of God. And I wanna go back and to give you a little recap from last week, very quick. I'm not going to come before you like uh, others have. I plan to just talk to you and share with you my heart. So last week we talked about that favor starts with submission and obedience to human leadership. Submission is compliance and surrender, and, you, and God can't trust you with his favor if he can't trust you with his leaders. And obedience is doing as you're told. It's a new concept in this era. It's a concept of not having your own opinion, not having your own mindset, but doing as you're told without murmuring, and without complaining. So you want the blessing of the Lord, this is your first step. You have to train yourself to humble yourself and listen to your leadership. Now I understand leadership is human, and as humans they will make mistakes, they will make errors, they will make flaws, they will say things that are dumb, and because I'm a leader, I've done it, and I've hurt people over the years, I've apologized, but you find out the apologies don't always fix things. But what you have to do, if you're going to deal with that first step, you have to ask God to help you how to deal with leadership that you know is godly placed for you and how you deal with them when they want you to do things that are outside of your purpose or just more than you can handle. God will show you how to do it. But most of all, most of all, don't complain. So today I want to do something different. I want to talk about the favor of God, the first warning. The favor of God, the first warning. The favor of God, the first warning. And as I said before, we're going to Judges chapter 13. We'll then skip over to Judges chapter 16. And I'm going to talk to you today. I'm not going to try to get in the African-American preaching vernacular. I'm going to make sure you get this because it has burned on my heart all week. And I really want to share my heart with you. There's nothing more exciting than living in such a relationship with God that we are confident that our prayers are being heard and we look forward to what God wants to do for us, through us, and in us on a daily basis. Now, some of you can call it favor. I, 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 you know, it's about as close as you can get to favor, but I wanna bring out these points I brought out last week and remind you what we, we looked at when we're talking about favor. Favor is not, N-O-T, is not about preferential treatment with God but it will give you God's ear. So here's the clarification on favor. This is what Galatians chapter two, verse six says out of the New King James Version. The apostle Paul clarifies clearly the mind of God. He says, but from those who seemed to be something, whatever they were, it makes no difference to me. God shows personal favoritism to no man. Insert that somewhere, highlight it in your Bible. God shows personal favoritism to no man. For those who seemed to be something added nothing to me. So our number one principle on favor is that God does not show personal favoritism. Next thing, favor is not about just is not just about being blessed. If that's the case, those in the Bible were treated unfairly by God. God. Hebrews chapter 11, 37 and 38 talks about they were put to death by stoning. They were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted and mistreated. And that's enough right there. So if, 
If it's about being blessed, why didn't folks in the Bible get the same blessing that we talk about today? A friend of mine has done many services. He's preached quite a bit in the continent of Africa. The last time he went to Nigeria, he, he, he called me and asked me to sincerely pray. Nigeria is a very hot country for Christians, and you can go there as a Christian, and you can be killed, and you, you're, you're, you will not be brought to justice. But he said his friend there, either in Nigeria or in the country of Ghana, told him, uh, uh, Brother so-and-so, the American gospel of prosperity does not work over here. Well, let me tell you right now, that's not the gospel. The gospel is the good news about Jesus Christ transforming and changing lives and souls. And, uh, but let me go on. So favor is not just about being blessed. Favor does not keep me from the punishment of God for sin. Sometimes we ask, you know, we ask each other. We don't ask God. We ask each other. We say, Lord, I wonder, you know, we, well, not Lord. We say, well, I wonder how they got away with that. Let me tell you, nobody ever gets away. God punishes sin. If there's anybody in the Old Testament that should have been blessed with the favor of God, it was the sweet psalmist of Israel, the under shepherd that God placed over his sheep, uh, the, the king himself, the, the one who the, in the, is in the line of Christ and started the line of Christ, King David. But when he sinned, his punishment was horribly severe. Lost two of his sons. They died and then lost a daughter who just dealt with the mental illness of what she went through and shut herself up as a widow the rest of her life. It was horrible. So don't tell me favor lets you escape the punishment of God. But let me tell you on a positive note, everybody Everyone, every single one of us who have given our lives to Jesus Christ according to the scripture have some level of favor because the exact same Greek word in the New Testament for grace is the exact same word used for favor. You can't separate them. They mean the same thing. It's God's unmerited favor to us, the totally undeserving. So God gave me a definition about favor, and I shared it with you last week, and I'll share it with you next week also, if the Lord is gracious to let me see the next week. But favor is about having such a relationship with God that he rebukes you, that he speaks to you, that he blesses you and uses you. Now look at the order God gave it to me in. Rebukes you, speaks to you. First of all, he said rebuke, speaks, blesses, third, and uses you all with the purpose of keeping you in right standing with him and making you an example to the saved and unsaved. Now that's favor. That's the favor of God. But as I go into this first message or the second message on the favor of God, the favor of God, the first warning, it's already time for this warning. And we, because we live in an arrogant country this week, this week, my God, we saw something we have not seen since 1814. Did you hear me? 1814. I'm not going to try to do the math in my head, but it sounds like it's about 207 years ago. Uh, uh, but uh, 1814, when the British invaders invaded Washington, D.C. and invaded the Capitol building. And, and, and But now we had this week people who broke down barriers and invaded the Capitol. And in their arrogance, they sat where they don't, didn't belong. They stole what they should not steal. And then they excused themselves and had the arrogant privilege to cut, get on camera and, and boast about what they have done. And they were able to get in their cars, get on airplanes and go back home. And five people died in the midst of that. You see, we live in an arrogant country. America has enslaved people and sold them as property. And then when we decided that it was enough, a civil war broke out. Everybody as I was coming up as a kid, uh, they would talk about the civil war was based on states' rights. Come on now. Yeah, the states' right to keep African-American people enslaved. America has displaced, massacred, and ridiculed the native people of this land 
for the sake of obtaining their land and their wealth. And to this day, they still suffer for the fact that we showed up with those ships back in the 1600s. America has started wars around the world. We're in one right now, the longest standing war we have ever been in and have invaded the sovereign territory of other countries, declaring that we're there for your freedom, but we didn't ask, they weren't, we weren't asked in. We just did it. And America allows, and this is just a few things we do, and pushes racist policies and degrades those that are of a different ethnicity of the, of the ruling class and cares nothing for the poor and loves and lusts for money and the list goes on. But here's my problem today, friend of mine. The church, especially the Pentecostal church, has picked up and promoted this arrogance and called it spirituality. We use the Bible to justify our arrogance. We pick up a scripture. I heard it today in a meeting uh, just, uh, just today. Isaiah 54 and 7. No weapon that's formed against me shall prosper. Keep saying that. Why'd they cut off Paul's head? why they crucify Peter? Oh, if they were great apostles, then why did they stone Deacon Stephen? Listen, don't tell me all of a sudden we're better than those in the Bible who had to run for their lives, imprisoned by a man named Saul before the Lord Jesus changed his life with the real gospel. But in our arrogance, we declare, no weapon that's formed against me shall prosper. And we pick up 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 4 and 5. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. My weapons are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And we declare and decree that we're pulling down, pulling things down, pulling things down. Stop it. Ah, it's not us if it works. It's God working through us. And we then go back and boast on our anointing. We boast on our spirituality. We boast on our prayer life. We boast on our time with God. And as a young man coming along in the church many, many years ago, People would say, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. And that would offend me because I had picked up that arrogance. I said, oh, no, Jesus transformed me. I'm a new creature. But at the end of the day, we are still sinners saved by the unmerited, undeserved favor of God Almighty. Thank you, Lord God, for it. Every scripture I've told you is true. But are we using them correctly? Or more importantly, as we use them, are we walking humbly before God? Have we forgotten that whatever we have from God, God gave it to us? We didn't pray it down. We didn't, we didn't tithe it down. God gave it to us. So I want to talk about this horrible, horrible word called arrogance. Arrogance, according to the dictionary, now, this is what the dictionary says. Now, think about this. If the dictionary says this, how much more must God hate it? The dictionary said it is the offensive display of superiority or self-importance. Friend of mine, I've been in the Pentecostal church all the time I've been saved, except for, I take that back, except for the first three months of my salvation experience. And ever since that time, I have found that we degrade and talk about other denominations. Oh, well, they don't have it like we do. And, and that makes us better. That makes us more superior. And we do all of these things and we forget that at the end of the day, we both came out of the muck and mire of sin. And many of those that declare this are yet struggling against sin. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 20 from the New Living Translation says, Paul told the Corinthian church, we often talk about the Corinthian church. Oh, they had problems. They were. The Corinthian church is a microcosm of the church today. 
gifted, arrogant, sinful, speaking in tongues all the time, doing all kind of things, but they had so many horrible things going on and they did not rebuke themselves and stop it. Second Corinthians 12 and 20. False Paul said, for I'm afraid that when I come, I won't like what I find and you won't like my response. I'm afraid that I will find quarreling, mm -hmm, jealousy, anger, selfishness, slander, gossip, arrogance, and disorderly behavior. This is all out of the New Living Translation. Isn't this all in the church today? James 4 and 16 out of the New King James Version. But now you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. But why is arrogance so bad? God told us what his mind was toward it back in the Old Testament. Proverbs 6 and 16 and 17 out of the Amplified Bible. He said, these things, six things the Lord hates. Indeed, seven are repulsive. Repulsive means disgusting and nauseating to him. A proud look. The attitude that makes one overestimate oneself and discount others. Mm. If you want to lose what little bit of favor we might say we might have with God, if we want to lose God's listening ear, keep walking in arrogance. Judges chapter 13, I'm going to go read verses 2 through 5. I'm going to skip down to verses 24 and 25, and then I'm going to do a fast forward all the way to Judges chapter 16, verse 20, all out of the New King James Version. So if you write that down, let me give it to you again. Judges 13, verses 2 through 5, and then 24 and 25, and then jump forward to chapter 16, verse 20, all in the book of Judges. Now, there was a certain man from Zorah of the family of the Danites, whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren and had no children. The angel of the Lord appeared to the woman, verse 3, and said to her, Indeed, now you are barren and have borne no children. But you shall conceive and bear a son. My God, what, a, what I, I, I imagine her eyes lit up. Her, 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 her countenance changed. I, I, I got a phone call this weekend that made my eyes light up and, and, and made me want to say, thank you, Jesus. And, and, and I, the tears came to my eyes because the good God that I serve, my father, God, had done the unimaginable, the unexpected. Mm, anyway, let me get back to this. You shall conceive and bear a son, verse four. Now, therefore, please be careful not to drink wine or similar drink and not to eat anything unclean. God intervened in the life of this couple and gave them their heart's desire as well as prenatal instructions. He said it again, for behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. Sometimes we can't get it, so God's got to repeat it to us. You shall conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come upon his head. For the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. What a word was on this baby. There were very few in the Bible that lived on this Nazarite vow. One was John the Baptist, and, but every one of them that had this was used by God. Typically, the Nazarite vow was for a period of time, but for those that were born in Nazarite for all of their life, God used them. God saw the plight of the people, and he sent help for them. The Nazarite was consecrated uh, uh, in the service of the Lord. His hair could not be cut. He had to abstain from any alcoholic beverage that ma made from the fruit of the vine, and he could not touch a corpse. Now keep that in mind, because we're talking about a fellow that, we, that you all probably know the story about, but I'm going to tell you the rest of the story here in verse 25, 24. So the woman, bore, the woman bore a son, the angel said that, and called his name Samson. Yes, that's who we're talking about. And the child grew, and the Lord blessed him. The Lord blessed him. The child grew, and the Lord blessed him. Verse 25, and the Spirit of the Lord began to move upon him at 
Mahana Dam between Zorah and Eshtael. The previous verse talked about the blessing of the Lord, but now the scripture adds that the spirit of the Lord moved upon him. Everything is going well for young Samson. But in between this verse and our next verse, we see Samson living a life of disregard for his vow. But God was still using him. None of the women in his life were in line with the Lord's direction according to his holy law. He was arrogant. But did the favor of God allow this to be ignored? No. Remember, Samson's purpose was to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. Be careful. God can still use you to fulfill his purpose and then put you aside when you decide to obey, to disobey. God can use you to fulfill his purpose and put you aside when you choose to disobey. Chapter 16, verse 20, the story of Delilah. The Philistine woman set up and sent to break Samson. He'd already destroyed one vow about don't touch a corpse. He'd already destroyed another vow about uh, uh, dealing with alcoholic beverages, but his hair was still long. And now the last vow was out there and you know the story. If not, go to chapter 16. It's a fascinating but sad story. And she convinced him to tell her the secret of his great strength. And she cut off his hair. And she said in verse 20, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. So he awoke from his sleep and said, I will go out as before at other times and shake myself free. Ah, oh, yes, here's the sad part of that verse. But he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. Samson's arrogance caught up with him and cost him everything. There's a positive end to the story. But why did Samson have to get to that point? Because in his arrogance, he refused to obey God. He looked at his giftedness. He looked how the Lord was blessing him. He looked at how God was using him. He looked at all of these things and ignored the basic things of God. Obedience to God. I'm going to remind you about our definition again. I'm going to say it over and over again. And once I tell you the definition, I'm going to bring this thing in and give you our instruction. What do we do from here? Favor is about having such a relationship with God that he rebukes you, speaks to you, blesses you, and uses you all with the purpose of keeping you in right standing with him and making you an example to the saved and unsaved. Listen, friend of mine, I'm trying to help you and me. Not just you, but me too. God wants to do amazing things for us and through us and in us but he won't do a single thing if he detects that putrid smell of arrogance and he will turn against you. You'll be saved, yes, but you'll not live the abundant life that Jesus promised us in John chapter 10, verse 10. So if God uses you, celebrate him and take absolutely no credit for yourself. It's not in your prayers. It's not in your fasting. It's not in your study. It's not in your giving. It's not in your so-called holy life. Remember, though, the Bible says all our righteousness is as filthy rags before God. It's not in your educational achievements. It's not in the mentors you sat under. It's only in the grace and mercy God our Father. Therefore, there's some things that we need to do this week. This week, starting today, first of all, we need to examine ourselves. It's not my anointing, not my power. It belongs to God. So therefore, every one of us must, must walk humbly before God, realizing it's his doing. It's his doing. 
Sometimes we say, oh, so-and-so couldn't do that because they don't have the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Listen, God will do what he wants to do. God will do what he wants to do. There was a man in China back in the 30s and 40s, great apostle. He had established a thousand churches in China before the, the communist revolution took over. And, and, and he did a great miracle one day as a young fellow. I mean, I, don't th I think he might have been a teenager or early 20s. It's in his autobiography. And, and, and uh, uh, then people will say he couldn't have done it. It was before he discovered the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Listen, God will do what he wants to do. Stop trying to put God in a box and elevate yourself in your arrogance. How dare you? How dare you? Uh, when we examine ourselves, we must examine our motives. Why do we do or say or declare the things that we do? Do we celebrate the Lord or do we celebrate our beliefs or we do celebrate ourselves? We're in the midst still. We are in some of the worst days of this pandemic. Somebody will say, Brother Preacher, are you afraid of the, the, the virus? I'm not afraid, but I'm cautious. Uh, I, I, I've had pneumonia twice. I, I've got circulatory issues in my legs. So therefore, I don't want to get the virus. So I practice. I listen to the CDC and our local county health department, our state health department, and do those things that are cautious. But I don't live in fear. I live in fear more so for the sheep that God has assigned for, to me to make sure that they don't come in arrogantly and say, no weapon that's formed against me shall prosper. Why did we lose so many bishops? Why did we lose so many pastors? Why did we lose so many church mothers to COVID-19 in the church of God in Christ? It has to do with our arrogance. All worship must go to God when he uses us and take nothing for ourselves. I love the story of Paul, and you've heard me say it so many times, when he was in the hurricane on the Mediterranean Sea. And after he had prophesied what to do and given instruction, and they were all safe on the little island of Malta, there's Paul still a prisoner, gathering sticks to put in the fire. Nobody raised him an offering. Nobody celebrated him as a great apostle. Nobody went and built him a throne. He's just still Paul. So first, we must examine ourselves. Then we have to repent of any arrogance. You know what repent means? Make a change. Not, not just say, oh, I'm, just, I'm sorry. No, no, no. I'm sorry and I'll never do it again if you'll help me. Give me guidance. Give me instruction, Lord. Show me how to do it. Give me step by step. Show me when I'm falling back into this because it's the kind of thing that has sucked so many in the church into this vortex, that putrid smell of arrogance. You may have to do this more than once. No, expect to do it more than once because we want to make sure whatever God wants to do with us, we're available. That he won't reach over toward us and smell arrogance and go on to somebody else. Third thing I want you to do is remember that we are just flesh and stay humble before God. I love you so much. God loves you so too also. He loves you also. God has done the unimaginable for us. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior, I challenge you today to give your life to Jesus Christ. And when, he, when you do that, don't get hung up on your testimony where God brought you from. Be hung up on this, that God did bring you from something and he caught you in time. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus. Ah, God, I love you. Oh God, I bless you. Oh God, I appreciate you. Oh God, I thank you. I give you the glory. I give you the honor. I give you the praise, and there's nobody like you. And I ask you, oh God, let this message sink into the hearts of your people. But first of all, let it sink into my heart. And as a song we used to sing said, if they find anything is in me that shouldn't be, take it out. Take it out, Lord. Correct me. Oh God, I want to be ready for your use. I bless you. Now, people of God, have an amazing day. 
And the Lord bless you abundantly is my prayer. In the name that's above all names, in the name of Jesus.